one of the things that is very important about potatoes and the other crops that we call root and tuber crops is that they are going to play an increasingly important role in the global food security system. Si pierden toda la papa, no solo está pierdiendo la papa, también el conocimiento, el cuento, las leyendas, el mito, hasta a través de la relación a la papa. Entonces la gente está preocupada, ¿no? ¿Por qué se va a perder la papa? Si es que poco a poco, un calentamiento global, va a perder. We now have an agriculture that we can characterize as being predicated on the idea of strength through exhaustion. The exhaustion of our resources that stand behind food production. We don't understand how fragile our food system is. We are the generation that has lived with cheap and abundant food and we take it for granted. We think if there's a problem with our food, the solution is to build another supermarket. This is a film about a food crop and two communities devoted to it. One celebrates its planting high in the Andean mountains. The other celebrates its harvest in the fertile plains of Minnesota. Both see this crop survival as vital to the world's food security. I wanted to make a film about the importance of diversity in our food supply, the stuff we grow, the stuff we eat. But who would ever really think about the potato in terms of biodiversity? For most of us, it's not much more than french fries. One of the attributes of the potato is its incredible flexibility. Just about the only place where it's not produced are in the Arctic poles. But other than that, you find it all over the planet. Potatoes were constrained to South America. They never moved north past uh, present-day Colombia. So the Spaniards discovered these treasures, introduced them into Europe, and it was actually from Europe that they were introduced into North America um, through the British colonization. Um, and of course, they did very well in North America. Potatoes have been in the family since 1880 when my great-grandpa homesteaded here. If I had to pick one potato out of all the potatoes I raised, I would pick the red Pontiac. They got the best flavor. Um, they, they store real well. They last into the spring a long time. Um, they're just an all-around good baking potato and a good frying potato. And a, I'd take the red Pontiac. The potato is a highly adaptable plant for a lot of reasons. The crop itself grows underground. It's not a root, but a tuber, a supply store of nutrition for the plant that grows above it. And what's good for the plant turns out to be pretty good for us. People think that the potato is, you know, laden with calories. Well, it's all the things that we do to it or put on it. You know, if it's sour cream or butter or gravy or whatever, those are really what adds calories to the potato. A single tuber or, or a couple of small little ones on a plate would only be about 100 calories, provides you with about 9 to 10% of, your, of the, your necessary fiber each day. One of those potatoes provides you with about 45% of the daily requirements for vitamin C, which most people find to be quite amazing, including myself. You know, it's about equal to an orange or maybe a little bit more. Susie Thompson is Rick's niece. Potatoes run in their blood. And Susie's right. The potato gets a bad rap for being fattening. It's not the potato's fault that we pile on so much stuff. And pile it on we do, especially when it's time to celebrate a crop that's so deeply rooted in one Minnesota town. What's, what's all this good stuff? Why are you here? We're here for potato days in Barnesville. And we're here to eat because it's all good. Big potatoes with everything on it. For the money that potatoes cost, it's the cheapest food that there is to eat. You can go to the store and buy 10 pounds of potatoes and eat the whole 10 pounds. Before the golden arches and french fries changed America forever, there was just the potato, baked or mashed. After World War II, a sign of wealth was meat and potatoes at dinner every night. I remember this from my childhood in the 1950s. 
We're selling lefse, which is a great old Norwegian food, and it is made with these staple potatoes and flour, and you mix it up and roll it out nice and flat and fry it on a large griddle. It tastes like heaven on earth. It just reminds me of my grandmother. She used to make lefse, she used to make potato sausage, put them together, wonderful combination. The potato was also a cultural icon for the emerging sound of rock and roll. People have a very emotional response to this crop, um, and usually it's, it's frivolity. Once the food price crisis hit, the conversation completely changed, and people stopped laughing and began to ask questions, what is the role of the potato in this global food system? In the early 1800s, the potato was one of the most important crops for all of the British Empire, including Ireland. But in the 1840s, disaster struck when blight decimated the crop. Thousands starved to death, and thousands more fled. For the peasants, a lot of their diet was based on potatoes and milk. And between potatoes and milk, all of our essential amino acids were supplied for our diets. So when the potato crop failed during the Irish potato famine, people started to perish because they didn't have foods in their diets that could replace what they were obtaining nutritionally from the potato. One critical element that contributed heavily to the crop collapse was that the farmers were growing only one type of potato. When a new disease struck, the entire crop was decimated. The potato famine is not necessarily behind us. The lesson is that we can't afford the kind of vulnerability where we depend on just a few food crops. We need to really develop resilient, healthy food systems. Pam Anderson is the head of the International Potato Center in Lima, Peru. There, over 5,000 varieties of potatoes and other tubers and roots are nurtured and protected. This is the most important collection of potatoes in the world, and we take that responsibility seriously. We are the contemporary custodians of this biological patrimony. In the SIP gene bank, what we see are different lines of defense. This is a very costly undertaking. We spend $1.2 million a year at least to protect this collection, and we do that by protecting it in different forms. Uh, we grow out the potatoes in our Highland Experimental Station to protect the tubers. We've converted all of the varieties into what are called true potato seed, which is the true botanical seed of the potato, and we keep those in vacuum-packed aluminum foils. We have the entire collection in vitro, which means we grow it in glass test tubes, which are free from diseases. We have experimentation going on for cryopreservation, extreme deep freeze. So we have this collection protected against major catastrophe.